Hi, thanks for joining me. My name's Alex Cowan. I've been an entrepreneur and an intrapreneur. I'm the author of this book, Starting a Tech Business, and I maintain this curriculum here at alexandercowan.com. So our agenda today is iterating to success. We're going to learn about evidence-based innovation, which is a technique where you, in small batches with learned validation, move towards a successful result for a new product. We're going to use Lean and Lean Startup to do that, along with a few other techniques. If you don't have your own product idea that you're working on, there are a couple available online at this address here that you can use. And you'll want to have one of those if you are going to actually do the exercises here. But you can also just follow along, and that's, of course, fine. My work is this in this area called venture design. And venture design is about helping innovators do the right thing at the right time. Because all the ideas that you need to be really successful are all out there, but there's quite a lot of them. And sometimes it's hard to know where to focus and how to use some of these things. At the foundation of this work is design thinking, which we covered in Venture Design 1. And at the operational core is this use of Lean Startup, which we're going to talk about today. I use the business model canvas as a way to look at the business model and evaluate it and discuss it. We draw heavily on Agile, especially the use of Agile user stories and iterations as a way to structure and organize product development. And so again, today we're going to focus on Lean Startup. Another way of looking at this is the skills that an individual wants to have to be successful working in a team like this. And for this, I have this idea of the full stack product person, which you see here. So there's a set of foundation skills that ideally are shared across an innovation team, which could be in a startup or in an existing company. And assuming it's software, everybody has this sort of basic level of technical literacy that you see here. And then on top of that, you have specialties that, that people bring to these uh, projects. And so we're going to focus on Lean. Before, we had this idea of a five-year plan was how we would run a business. And I think that was invented by Stalin for running a planned economy. And now we have this use of Lean and Lean management, which it turns out is much better suited to startups. And the reason why is you have a compounding of assumptions and a lot of unknowns in a startup. And so you, you want structure to work through those things. But a five-year plan demands a degree of visibility to be useful that, that you just don't have in any startup or any, any innovative new product. So to give you an intuition about the difference that I'm talking about here, let's go through a product ID. And we'll talk about the old way and the new way. Our idea that we're going to use is a talking bicycle compass. And um, the first thing we would do in the old way is write a business plan. So we have this idea that cyclists need better guidance when they're out cycling. And so we write a business plan about how we're going to create this bicycle compass. And then since businesses need capital and they need to be situated somewhere, we go and we raise money. And then we get an office space and chairs and secretaries and all this stuff. And we're committed. We're all in on this bicycle compass. <clears throat> so we're going to spend a lot of time building the best possible talking bicycle compass. And we're going to make sure we're making money so we invest in cost reduction. We need to get out to lots of retail outlets so we sell to them and make sure that we meet all their requirements for packaging and distribution. At the end... We have a focus group and we hear from them that they'd really like it if the product allowed them to also track the progress of their friends. And since you never get a second chance to make a first impression, we go ahead and we add that feature and we delay some. And then we go out to the market and hopefully we're wildly successful. But here's the tricky part. We spent a lot of time and money doing this and we probably have something like a 1 in 20 chance of being successful with a new product. So here's a different way of going about this that's probably going to be more successful in this situation. First, 
we do a lot of customer discovery. We go out and we learn all about cyclists. What do they think and see and feel and do around cycling? And we think about and we observe what problems do they have? What unfulfilled or underfulfilled needs and desires and jobs exist for them? And we figure out if we have something valuable to deliver against that. And let's say we believe we do, we believe we can with a talking bicycle compass. Well, then we figure out the cheapest, quickest possible way to validate or invalidate that we're really gonna be delivering something of substantial value against that problem scenario. So with the talking bicycle compass, what we might do is duct tape an iPhone, a microphone, and a compass to their bike and we're going to call them, track their location on GPS, and we'll just verbally give them directions. Now, this isn't practical or scalable or anything you would want to operate as a business, but that's not the point. The point is to learn, is to learn whether we have something that's relevant or not before we waste time and money scaling it up and making it perfect. If we find that We've delivered something valuable there because the cyclists ask us when our product is coming out and they ask us if we'll do it again for them. Then at that point, we build the simplest possible bicycle compass, talking bicycle compass, and release it to the market. That doesn't mean a cheap or crappy version. It just means a version that's very much just focused on the things that we believe are critical to delivering on that value proposition. And then we see what happens because we don't really know. And if we see that we're headed in the right direction, we incrementally scale up this effort, meaning that we keep adding more features, we expand the breadth of the product until uh, we're happy with it. And in that sense, um, you know, we're, we're at a point where we're going to scale up and just, you know, we can continue to produce these, observe what happens. And I think that you can see in the second case, this second team has a much higher chance of being successful because a they're doing a much better job of learning about the customer they're more knowledgeable about the customer and they can make smarter decisions and two they're taking way more shots at being successful and so if you have a one in 20 chance just the basic geometry of uh of their operation is going to be much better so the Lean Startup is great because what it gives us is structure, which is really good. It's important. You've got a lot going on in a startup. It's important to be very purposeful and structured, but we need something that's lightweight and adaptable. So Lean Startup really uses this one technique that we've had for many, 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 many years, deliver us many great things, science. And in the scientific method, we have an idea. And in this case, we ask ourselves, do we have compelling evidence from our buyer that, that we have something interesting here. We start with that. Then we need to create a hypothesis, which is just a set of assumptions that can be explicitly proven or disproven with some kind of experiment that we're going to do. And so, for example, we had the hypothesis that it would be valuable if we could give cyclists um, specialized talking guidance. So. Then we created an experimental design with the duct tape and whatnot, and we saw whether or not they cared. And that's, that's the next step, is you design experiments that give you the cheapest, quickest result to figure out if you're barking up the right tree. And we are focused on doing those experiments. And this is really good because in a startup environment, in an innovative environment, you have this difficult pairing of urgency and uncertainty. And focusing on these experiments and making sure that everybody understands that your purpose is to learn and to figure out if you have something to scale or not, it, it turns out, in my opinion, to be a very valuable management tool as well. We're driving to this moment where we either say, we're going to pivot, we're going to do something new, we've proven that this just doesn't make sense, or we're going to scale this up, we're going to intelligently invest in moving forward on this idea because it looks promising. So let's start by focusing on how do you create an idea that, that's actionable in this sense. And in Venture Design 1, we covered the use of design thinking and personas. So a quick recap on that is a persona is a humanized version of who your customer is or customers. 
And think, see, feel, do is a good way to kind of operationalize that persona and give it some direction. So, <clears throat> for example, with a talking bicycle compass, we'd ask, what do cyclists kind of rationally think about the whole thing of, of cycling? What do they see? I mean, when they look at what other cyclists are doing or what people are saying about cycling, what do they observe? Um, what do they what do they feel? What what kind of how does cycling make them feel? How does it gratify them? What reward are they looking for when they cycle? And then what do they actually do? What do we observe them actually doing? Then we get to problem scenarios. And if we're talking about a business product, we're asking, well, what what fundamental jobs are we doing for this customer? Because in, in a business, they're fundamentally at a certain level, no new jobs. We do the same basic things, sell stuff, make stuff, keep track of our inventory and money. And if it's a consumer product, we're asking what existing need or desire are we delivering on? Because those also haven't changed. Then we look at alternatives. And if the problem scenario really exists, they should be easy to identify. And they're important because next we think about um, a value proposition. So with alternatives, we're, we're looking at, for example, in a business context, let's say we're going to build some enterprise software that replaces a bunch of spreadsheets. Well, we'd go out and we'd look at the spreadsheets that customers currently use in this area because that tells us a lot about what they do, what they think about this area, where they're focused, the language that they use to talk about their problem as opposed to the language we think we use to talk about their problem. If it's a consumer application, let's say we're going to build an application for parents to distribute allowances to kids. Well, we'd ideally go where they are and take a photo of their fridge if that's where they keep track of the completion of chores or a bulletin board or whatever. Then we look at value propositions and we're asking ourselves, are we bringing something to this problem that's better enough than the current alternatives where the customer is going to buy this product from us. And you can stitch this together in this hypothesis, this provable or disprovable format as follows. A certain persona exists, we're assuming, and this could be more than one. They have these certain specific problems that are important to them. They're right now using a certain set of alternatives today and we're going to deliver something that's better enough than those alternatives where they're going to buy this product from us, use this site, whatever relationship we want to have with a customer. So now we're going to do an exercise. Take four minutes and formulate your uh, value hypothesis, your, I'm sorry, venture hypothesis. Um, or we called it in Venture Design 1, um, your product hypothesis. So, um, if you've already done this in Venture Design 1, you can skip ahead. Otherwise, I'm going to pause for a second here so you can pause the, uh, the video and then I'm going to move on. So we talked about the ideation process and um, now we're going to go into a little more detail on how to structure our hypothesis and an experimental design so that you can move ahead with this practice of lean startup. And the output of this these assumptions are, are going to look something like this chart. And the critical thing is to have a prioritized set of truly strategic and pivotal assumptions. I do a lot of work um, with the Lean Startup folks, which I enjoy. And the top two problems I see in the practice of Lean Startup are, number one, that teams don't actually write down all their assumptions and that Lean Startup can't really help you that much if, you don't, if you're not explicit about speaking what those assumptions are. And then the second problem I see is that there are too many assumptions. There's like 100 assumptions. And, and that's bad, too, because with that many assumptions, you're not really going to be focal and, and prioritized um, with the assumptions. So the first problem you can solve with a simple table, like the one you see here. And the second problem of prioritization you can solve with a column where, you know, with, with priorities. I use a priority one to mean this is a pivotal assumption. If it's disproven, we're going to either can or substantially reformulate this idea. And then I use everything after that to mean this is an assumption that um, is either kind of a child of, of, a, of a strategic assumption or it's something that's tactical. So, for instance, um, 
it might be an idea for a feature about the product that, you know, the product could be a huge hit without it, but we, we want to record that and keep an eye on it, but it's not one of our stru truly, truly pivotal things. And, and really that's what the focal discipline of a lean startup is about, that crossing your T's and dotting your I's, none of that stuff really matters unless it's helping you drive towards that pivot or persevere moment and that you should subject all your activities to that litmus test. So in terms of getting organized and actually doing this stuff, we're going to work through the use of Lean Startup by organizing our material about our new product into four areas of hypothesis. Our persona hypothesis, our problem hypothesis, our value hypothesis, and our customer creation hypothesis. So the idea with the persona hypothesis is we're figuring out, do we know who this customer is and do we know what makes them tick? So we did a lot of this in Venture Design 1, but uh, and you can skip this if, if, you've, uh, if you've already done all this, but we, we, we first want to make sure we validated that the persona really exists and we can identify them out there in the world. A great litmus test is off the top of your head, can you think of five to 10 real world people that represent this, this persona that, that you're thinking of? And then go out and interview them and work with them. And um, what shoes do you wear is a great way to think about whether you, you really understand this persona well. We did a day in the life exercise in Venture Design 1, which is also available in the same set of workshops as its own standalone thing. And then there's this idea of think, see, feel, and do that um, are, are a good way of operationalizing your persona. And, and really the best way is to go out and create an interview guide, which you can do in the Venture Design template that we covered in Venture Design 1. And, and you go out and actually interview those people and, and see if you feel that you understand those things and you're hearing the same things and observing the same things over and over again. So the output of your persona hypothesis should be validated personas that are written up. And you can see the address for the template to use for those, the venture design template here in this slide. Things that are really common micro pivots here are resegmentation of the personas, usually making them more granular. And that's good, and that's not a mistake, and that's natural. Starting with one persona, say, marry the mom, and then, you know, resegmenting that into Wanda, the working mom, and um, Cindy, the stay-at-home mom. Th those are really a much better result than having tried to artificially create a whole bunch of personas that you weren't really sure if they existed. So this is a common thing to happen. It's natural and it's productive. The um, Some teams find out after they, they interview the personas that there's a much sexier problem scenario out there than the one they originally thought. That happens all the time. And I think that's great. It's exciting. That's design thinking, delivering very early on, on, on its promise of helping you make better decisions and create better things. And then sometimes there's a strategic pivot, like, hey, this, these people, this problem area, it's just not for us. Another thing that personas will help you with is your identification of an early market versus a later market. So I, I won't go through this in a huge amount of detail, but there was a, a really popular body of work by a guy named Jeff Moore called Crossing the Chasm. And if you're older than 32, 35, you probably read it in college if you, if you were in startups and business. The basic idea is that there's very often an early market that you can connect with and sell them things because they're inquisitive, they like new things. But then between that market, which is relatively tiny, and the mainstream market, there's this chasm of pragmatism. The mainstream market doesn't buy the way the early adopters do. You need to have a much stronger beachhead in that market to anchor in the mainstream market and, and really keep things moving up and to the right. Personas are a great way to look at this because they help you, if, if everything's moving up and to the right and you think, well, I can just extrapolate to gigantic success, Knowing who the people are behind those numbers will help you figure out, you know, are we selling to a teeny market of, of people that, you know, really can't scale or, you know, are these mainstream buyers that are, that are a huge population that we can, you know, just keep doing what we're doing and be fine. Another way of, of looking at this that I like is, is this pool of billiards. And the metaphor there is, 
the, the first thing I learned about pool after how to hit the ball was you're always looking at the next shot. So you want to get a ball in, but then you want to leave the cue ball, the white ball, in a place where you can hit the second ball. So for example, let's say we're making an app that we ultimately want to sell to a really broad market, teens and, um, and their parents. Well, you know, these two sets of personas, broad personas, spend a lot of time in minivans together, but they don't want to buy the same thing. So you'd certainly want to sell to the teens first, and then, you know, probably the parents don't care if they use what the teens use, but, you know, the, the reverse is, is very likely untrue. Um, so let's do an exercise for four minutes. Who's your early market? Um, thinking about your customer base in terms of personas, step through these three questions and and think about the answers to those. And um, Enable Quiz is the example company you see here. They're a fictional company that's building a lightweight quizzing app for companies that hire a lot of engineers so that they can validate basic technical skill sets. So if I'm hiring a Linux sysadmin, I would use this quiz to quickly see, okay, do they are they really advanced in this topic or just sort of basic skill set or, or not at all? And that's the example you're seeing here. So I'll pause for a second here, and then I'll move on. Our next exercise here is one where you'll write down a few questions that you think you could use to go out and discover from interviewing subjects, uh, people who represent your various personas, the answers to these questions we pose. So um, again, you'll see examples from Enable Quiz. One good place to start is, you know, tell me about yourself in the role of HR manager or hiring manager. What's it like? Um, and it, tell me about your area of interest. You know, tell me about hiring engineers. And what's good about these two initial questions is you always want to start broad and then, you know, as needed, get narrow and get specific. And the reason for that is what the most valuable thing you can get is an unprompted response that validates, you know, your, your persona hypothesis, your problem hypothesis. And the more that you prompt the subject, the more likely you're going to be getting sort of, you know, false answers that are just designed to sort of satisfy your, your line of inquiry. Um, tell me your thoughts about such and such an area. What do you, what do you see in this area? What are your peers doing? What do you read about? What have you heard is a best practice or popular or cool, you know, depending on your area? And how does this make you feel? You want to leave this till later, but you want to make sure that you get this because ultimately in your customer acquisition process, if you're not connecting with an underlying emotional driver, some need or desire, you'll, you'll struggle to get your customers to do anything that's, that's really truly important. Um, and finally, you want to get questions about what they actually do. You know, how many engineers did you hire last month? Um, what is your interview questionnaire look like? Would you mind sharing it with me? Things like that. That's the, the sort of the do part of your personas. Key things for good persona discovery are creating a, a comfortable environment between you and the other person, just like you're making a friend or selling somebody something. Two is, um, you know, acclimate them to the idea that you're really interested in all the minute little details about their life and not just sort of the general picture. People aren't used to being interviewed and, and talked to in this way. And generally, they're just going to say, oh, well, whatever, I hire engineers, you know, it's the same every time. When, when in fact, life is incredibly varied and complex and everything's always different. It's just a matter of sort of drawing that out. And that's, that's a skill that you'll learn as you, as you do this a few times. It, it does take practice. And um, do not sell. Don't advocate a point of view. Don't prompt them. <clears throat> that's the best way to, you know, shut them down and just get them sort of parroting back to you what, what you want to hear. Our next area is the problem hypothesis. So a good checklist for this is that uh, you've identified at least one discrete problem scenario that you can specifically identify. And then you validated that that problem is important, that it, that it matters to them. And that's where this sort of unprompted line of questioning comes into play. So you want to ask them a broad question. And then if your particular problem scenario comes up early in the game, well, then that's, that's a good sign. That's a sort of a generalized validation. 
you want to make sure that you understand their current alternatives, how they use them, why they use them, how good they feel about those alternatives. And the outputs to this are your problem scenarios paired with alternatives. And common pivots here are that um, you end up going to a more material problem area, something that's more important. Uh, strategic pivot is, is another one. And here's a few ideas on questions. This is an exercise where we'll, we'll take five minutes once once I finish here. So a good lead thing is, hey, what are the five hardest things about your area of interest? Now, this is a good general question, but giving them a number and five, five is just an example is a good way of getting them to tell you, getting across the idea that, you know, you're interested in kind of the details. You're interested in a lot of, of stuff beyond just the sort of standard um, water cooler answer that they might give to this question. Um, how do you currently operate in, in this area? Or, you know, um, another good one is, hey, here's what I've understood from what you said. Is that right? That's a good way to continue to tease out answers and, and get them to give you relatively high quality uh, unprompted answers. Asking them, you know, what's hard about your area of interest as, as you focus in. Um, that's another that's another good way to get more detail once you once you're starting to kind of narrow the scope of your your line of questioning. What are the top five things that you'd like to do better? This is another good um, way to sort of get um, validation and, and calibration of, of what they care about in your area. And um, and then you know and this is something you would really only want to ask at the end is if you don't hear anything about your area. At the end, it's okay to ask them, hey, why isn't such and such on your list? I mean, do you think about that at all? I mean, it's a, like, sort of a throwaway question, but um, if you feel like you just didn't hear anything, um, it, it, you might hear something interesting when, when you ask that. But I would only ask that at the very end of your, your questioning. Keys to good problem discovery, very similar to the persona stuff. Um, avoid prompting, you know, only do that at the very end. Get them in storytelling mode, and that's the best way to do that is to focus on a specific example because that'll that'll help you dig under that that veneer of like, well, you know, it's always pretty much like this. You know, ask them about a specific event example, and um, just focus on getting them talking. Try, you know, you you do need to watch the amount of time that they're going to give you, but try to avoid interruptions um, because again, that that'll sort of clam them up and they'll they'll stop talking as much uh, and as freely. So back to our Lean Starter process. Now we're going to talk about experimentation. So how do we go to the hoop and see if we've got something valuable that our, our personas are going to care about? And a good checklist for this is um, we, uh, you know, we sort of going back to the, the product hypothesis or the venture hypothesis, we're, we're trying to validate we've got something that's better enough than the alternative where the customer is going to buy it. That's really the crux uh, of this part of the hypothesis. And, you know, will customers perceive the superiority of this? I mean, how obvious how obvious is it to them that we have something more valuable? How much um, education and explanation is that going to take? And the output of this is validated value propositions and um, common pivots are changing up the way that you're delivering value against the problem scenario. So it's really good to get married to a set of personas and a set of problem scenarios, but it's really bad to get too married to any one solution in the early phases because you want to let the evidence tell you what to do, not, not get you know, too emotionally attached to a particular solution. Often uh, teams will pivot to a new problem area, that's fine, or make a strategic pivot out of this line of uh, business entirely. So most of the good results in this area need to be obtained from direct experimentation, which we're going to talk about in a minute. But here are a couple of questions you can see that you may want to take a couple minutes and just write down because you may want to add them to your interview guide. So I'm going to pause. Um, I would take around two minutes to do this. And then I'll move on. One of the central concepts of Lean Startup is this idea of a minimum viable product. And by that, um, the, the meaning of minimum is what's the fastest, cheapest way to prove or disprove this idea. So that's the duct tape with the talking bicycle compass and um, similar things that we're going to go through 
in a minute. And the, and why do we do that? You know, because we're cheap. No, I mean we want to. We're in a high risk venture with a lot of uncertainty. We want to give ourselves as many shots at being successful as we possibly can. That's that's really the underlying economic reason to do this. Viable. So the MVP, which may or may not be actual working product, as we saw with the bicycle compass example, it, is it going to give us a definitive result where we can look at some metric or some indicator and say, yep, we validated it or no, we didn't. That's that's a critical attribute of any MVP. And then product, well, I think that the critical thing there is, do we really need to build product? Most of the time when the answer is, when the outcome is, is yes, the startup team gets busy building an app because they're hoping the magic will happen, they probably could have done some really valuable testing without any working product at all. Um, that's not always the case, but, but it often is. And then if you're in an existing company, one important consideration is, hey, do we have license to go out and use alternative brands and channels? Are we constrained by doing things as you know the, the parent company? So um, the key thing to think about with the minimum viable product is also, you know, this this isn't necessarily a product, and it's a learning vehicle. So we're not getting married to it as a solution. Um, it's not a project plan. It's not a product development plan. We're not trying to get things done. We're not trying to create output. We're trying to create outcomes. We're trying to see what happens in the sort of imaginary future that we're envisioning where our personas are using our product and they're getting value from it. And that's a really key idea is thinking about the difference between output versus outcomes. If you're Operating as a as a part of a machine for a, a, a scaling business that's just you know they understand what they're doing they just need to do it better and scale it up output's important if you're in an innovative situation where you're creating something fundamentally new that you don't know if it's going to work or not outcomes are important and that's really the the key litmus test for your MVP now we're going to step through a few real world examples of how this MVP concept has performed in the real world. Dropbox is maybe the, the best known MVP example out there. And the opportunity they had was the file sharing business was something that was ready to take off. There was demand, the infrastructure was there. And the challenge was it was a space that had a lot of competitors, all of which were doing not that great. So they were having trouble raising money. And to build the really great product that they thought would make the space take off was going to require a bunch of time and money. So if we go through this in the frameworks we've been using, their early market persona was Tom the Techie. So works on a lot of digital projects, has a problem of lots of different files that are changing, that need to be shared with different people that may be very large. And the current alternatives are ad hoc setups, or maybe they use one of these less compelling products somewhat. And our value proposition to Tom is if we had a really great cross-platform product that worked really well, well, we think that he'd really like that and he'd start to use it. So what's an MVP that these guys could do that wouldn't require any software at all and they could just bootstrap with uh, little or no money that they had? Think about that for a second. And the answer is... They built a, a synthetic demo, which in the UX world is, is called the Wizard of Oz demo because it looks real, but behind the scenes, it's all just faked up. They created this, put it on a sign-up page, drove some traffic to it, and they had great uptake. And it was catered to the persona, which they understood. It had oblique references to science fiction stuff and math things. So it was for the market at large, but they had... Uh, a particular understanding of Tom the Techie and a focus on that. Tom the Techie is made up by me, not not by the Dropbox team. And the rest is history. They got great traction from this these signups and raised money and became the wildly successful household name that they are today. Enable Quiz is this synthetic company that that's made up for example purposes here. And they think that the opportunity is that it's really hard to hire engineers and qualify for skill sets. And um, the team wants to bootstrap the company that they, they don't or can't go out and raise money. And um, they're trying to figure out what technical domain they should validate or invalidate first because they could 
find an early market in a couple of different subdomains within this general rubric of technical stuff and engineering. So their personas are Helen, the HR manager, who's in charge of hiring in general and sourcing resumes, and Frank, the functional manager, who is in charge of uh, actually managing these people and, and um, issuing the requirements for these new hires. And the problem scenario is that Helen has trouble screening for technical skills, and so does Frank, because he doesn't really have enough time, and it, he doesn't want to be a jerk during interviews and grill people. So they call references, um, ask a few questions, take people's word for it. But we think if we could deliver them a really easy to use app that would allow them to just, they could just put in front of candidates and screen them and understand that, well, we think that that would be compelling for them. So what would be an MVP that, uh, that would help them do this and that, that they could bootstrap? One, um, one good way to do this, uh, particularly this specific question of um, which technical subdomain they should focus on would be running some Google AdWord campaigns around, you know, hire Ruby engineer or hire .NET engineer and see which ones get better click-throughs and better landing page signups and um, then they can make an informed selection about the topic. Another thing they could do more about the core product is what we call a concierge MVP. And that means we're hand creating the experience we want the customer to have. So the, the duct tape bicycle compass was basically a concierge MVP. An enable quiz could do a concierge MVP by just creating paper quizzes and giving them to HR managers and functional managers and seeing if they find that valuable. Do they get better outcomes? Do they find it handy to have this information? So that that's sort of a related MVP that they could do to validate more the, the core proposition. Um, Lean It Systems is a uh, IT company that, that makes enterprise software that I, I founded in 2007. And Lean It builds um, enterprise software solutions for service providers, mostly in hosted communications. These are phone companies and cable companies. And initially we started, it was, it was just me, and we had to bootstrap and, and scale up. And so our persona was Chris, the CTO. He's um, he's got funding in this um, this evolving telco or communications provider to figure out how they're going to evolve the business and what are good opportunities for them. IT, so building the back office systems and user portals and billing and things like that. That's one of the most expensive and time consuming um, things that they have to do to roll out a new product when they they want to do that. And so they either have to place risky bets on big new systems and upgrades or kind of make small incremental changes by, by hand. And the value proposition that Lean had wanted to explore was, well, you know, can we give them modular best practice solutions in key areas like services provisioning and end user portals where they can sort of slot those into their existing infrastructure and you know, on the one hand, be able to move faster, and on the other hand, be able to scale up and, and grow the business quickly if they find um, they're in a the business that they like. So um, what would be a good MVP for Leonid that we, that we could bootstrap? And the answer was basically a sort of series of MVPs where they all sort of fall into this concierge MVP rubric. So we started out doing consulting, and that helped us make money, establish relationships, successful relationships with customers. And then on the basis of what we learned, we created productized consulting. So these were repeatable engagements that we could do over and over again. It was good for customers because they were able to know exactly how much they were going to pay and they got what they expected and we were able to describe it to them better. And then we ultimately evolved towards creating products. And that was a very productive evolution because at that point we had very well validated problem scenarios and we were able to um, deliver into existing customer relationships those solutions. So Zappos is a, is a household name that you've probably heard of. They started way back in 1999 and the founder observed that um, a lot of people who know what kind of shoe they want but can't find it um, in, in a local retail. And in 1999, online retail was still kind of nascent. So it wasn't the sort of obvious, sure, we'll sell it to them online thing that, that it would be today. 
and he was bootstrapping this business. So if we put this in our, our framework, we have Sam the shoe hound knows what he wants but not where to get it. And currently he shops at local retail or maybe waits till he goes to the big city or um, possibly uses mail order. And if we could give him a good online shopping experience where he could find the shoe that he wants at a good price, we think that we could build that into a really good business. So what would be a good MVP for these guys that wouldn't require any software at all? And the answer is he just photographed a bunch of shoes at a local shoe store, put them on a website, priced them, and then sold them to people. And then if they sold, he'd just walk down to the shoe store and ship them the shoes. Now that in itself is not a good business. He, he probably, taking into account his own time, he probably lost money on every shoe. But that wasn't the point. He wasn't trying to scale up a shoe retail business online. He was trying to see if a shoe business online made any sense at all. And he was able to do that, and the, the rest is history. Uh, Sprig is a startup in the Bay Area that's um, kind of like Uber meets Whole Foods. So you can order um, fresh meals um, through, through an app to your doorstep. And this is a big opportunity. There's some existing competitors in the space with different takes on it. And of course, the, the food prep and um, food delivery business is a gigantic multi-billion dollar business. And, but the challenge was they, this fundraising was kind of slow and they wanted to get started right away. It's a hot space, a really good team. They knew what they wanted to do. So their persona is Paula the professional. I'm uh, sort of making this up a little bit. Who's health conscious, short on time. She has moderate to high income and she already uses um, similar online services like Uber to order taxis. And she wants to have a nice healthy dinner, but um, it's got to be low hassle and it can't be too expensive. And currently she goes to the store, maybe she goes to whole splurges on a Whole Foods deli meal sometimes, um, or she uses existing delivery services that are, that are slow and the selection isn't great. So we think at Sprig, if we could deliver a healthy, delicious meal, dinner on demand, prep time is um, three taps and the prices are delectable, that's directly a quote from the, the Sprig homepage. We think that's a value proposition that would resonate. And so what's a good MVP for Sprig? Because they want to get going. They want to start learning right away about this space and how to be successful in it. And it turns out what they did was they hired a chef for the day. They created an Eventbrite, which is an online um, event sign-up thing where you can charge people. They emailed it to some friends, and the, um, the Eventbrite was a proxy for ordering a meal, and they, they were able to learn a lot about what it was like to prep this and deliver it. Now, the whole thing was probably, you know, very strapped together and, and probably very time consuming and difficult. But again, their point wasn't to build a whole food preparation and delivery infrastructure. It was to see what, if any angle on this, on this general business would, would make sense for them. And they got great uptake, made a lot of valuable observations in there today. They're, they're trucking along. Paul Howe and his colleagues had a funded venture to test through and, and experiment with a bunch of business to consumer startup concepts. And one idea they had was the people would like to know how much their all their stuff is worth. So putting this in our terms, we uh, th the persona they didn't really identify, I think they were going to sort of reverse into that based on their, their experiment. The problem scenario is I have a lot of stuff around and I might want to sell it or I'm curious about how much it's worth, how much I'm spending. The alternatives that they, they go through this stuff manually and, and figure it out. The value proposition is it's interesting and possibly useful to know how much all your stuff is worth. And um, so our usual question, what's a good MVP for these guys that would require no um, real software development? And it turns out what they did was they got a few signups and they got logins to go look at the bank statements and email these people with permission, of course. And um, they manually went through and did their own searches and compiled these reports of how much the user's stuff is worth. And it turns out the, the participants didn't really care. It wasn't that useful. And, you know, that's part of the, that's part of what Lean Startup is about is getting definitive results and ideas before they went out and built a whole huge software infrastructure to build this and then found out that nobody cared. So this, in, in that sense, this is a very good result that they got because they moved on to the next thing very quickly without spending a lot of time and money. 
um, photo social. So sharing photos is a, is a, is a big space. And I advised a startup team that was at the um, startup lab at, at Stanford. And so their persona was um, sort of existing posters of photos on social media, like Martha the mom, Pat the party planner, Teresa the, the teen social butterfly. They had a few that they were looking at. And the problem scenario that these people have is I want to do something interesting with my photo that my social graph, my social group will find interesting. So they manual enhance photos. They use things like Instagram and um, they're still in stealth mode. So I won't say what their particular value proposition was, but they had an angle on um, delivering on this problem scenario. And so if we if we think about the user journey for a photo social app, photos are taken something is done with them to make them more interesting, visually interesting, make them tell a story. They're uploaded or shared on Instagram, Facebook, Snapchat. And then what the user is looking for is um, social acclimation, you know, likes, shares, retweets, whatever. And so the key assumption about um, a successful app is that we're going to help users do something with their photos that will generate a lot of activity on social media, which, which gratifies them and gives them a reward. So given all that, what do you think is a good MVP for such a venture? It turns out it was very productive to just create the target output by hand, share it, and see if users responded. There was no need to go through, you know, and build all, all this infrastructure to do all this, this stuff automatically if we didn't know if people wanted to do it in the first place. And in, in this case, they learned that people didn't like it very much, it wasn't that interesting, and they, they pivoted to a new concept. So the key lessons about MVPs are that software doesn't have any of its own magic. I think um, there's an idea that, hey, if we could just get the app done, maybe it'll, you know, catch fire and take off. It doesn't really happen that way. I mean, the, the software has to have you put the magic in it. It doesn't have any of its own magic. Um, and this idea of an MVP, particularly a concierge MVP, where you're taking the user through the process, um, this can be a really good way to validate and focus your idea. And um, basically what you're looking to do is find 100 people that really, really are into your product. And then you know, if you can do that, you can probably grow from there. Now we're going to do an exercise for you to think about the MVP you, you might use to validate or invalidate your product idea. And a few specific things to think about in the exercise, which will take five minutes to do, is um, what is the experience that you want to provide? And what are, the, what are the preconditions and general steps to execute it? What are the metrics that you're going to observe and say proven or disproven on your, your value hypothesis? And then finally, how are you going to identify and qualify participants? So how do you go out and find people and how do you make sure that they're, they're meaningful and relevant to kind of validating your core idea? So I'm going to pause. We'll take five minutes for this exercise and then I'll move on. We're going to close with this idea of lean at large. So using lean not for brand new products and strategic things, but um, sort of everyday everyday tasks. So here's an example we saw um, the assumptions table and there was these priority two assumptions in them. So like let's say we're making an app for parents to organize allowances. Well maybe they want to link allowances to chores. You know that's not that's a good thing to look at and figure out but it's not the fundamental pivotal assumption. The pivotal assumption is the one above the priority one assumption that parents want an app to organize the distribution of allowances. Maybe they want to do chores um, with that app, maybe they don't. And so this kind of practice of lean at large is about, you know, rather than arguing about things, let's state what our assumptions are and then figure out a way to test them. Um, recently, I was uh, working on a startup with some collaborators and we had a bunch of UI user interface assumptions that we made about you know if we, it was about drag and drop will the user understand this or not and we didn't know this was a team of people who built a bunch of products and we were relatively familiar with web development but we don't know 
whether a metaphor is going to work and in a lot of cases if it's a relatively new thing if it's if it's experimental so we noted our assumptions and we figured out how we would test this stuff very early in the user testing and that's an example of what i would call lean at large lean in general so from a process perspective with venture design we're looking to make sure we understand who our customer is what problems they care about and imagining a future where we're delivering a value proposition to them that's better enough than those alternatives. To that idea, we link assumptions and then we go out and do discovery and do testing to validate or invalidate those. And if we're going to build something, we do user stories and prototypes. That's something we'll cover in Venture Design 5. And then we're driving this moment where we say, this isn't looking good. Let's try something else before we run out of time and money, or let's intelligently invest in scaling this up. Now, you're not always going to be able to do all this stuff at the very beginning of the process. So let's look at the whole thing in reverse. We've got product. The first question we want to ask is, did the product deliver on the user stories that we created to deliver on the value proposition? Then we look at you know, when the, the customer encountered this, how did they react? What, what actually happened? And then we ask ourselves, was the, the story, the way that we implemented it, um, was it relevant to the value proposition we were looking to deliver? And then if we peel back that onion even further, we're asking, did, did the problem that we were going to deliver on, was it actually important to the persona? And then at the the core of the proverbial onion, we have, you know, do we understand who this customer is and what makes them tick? So we're going to close, um, if you're in a group, with um, class presentations. So um, the presenters will answer the questions that you see here, and um, the audience will ask questions in the fashion that, that you see. So I'll pause for a moment while you do that. And so in closing, I think the, the most important thing to keep in mind with this is that um, you're looking to build a set of skills here. And if you do that, these are skills that you'll always be able to use. So you are the most important part of the experiment. And you should always make sure you're learning. This was our agenda for today and how it fits into the Venture Design Program. In terms of specific next steps, the basic idea is to articulate your assumptions and then design and execute your experiments and drive to that pivot or persevere moment. There's a template at the bottom here which will help you just do some of the basic housekeeping, if you like, of uh, creating those assumptions, laying them out, prioritizing them. And um, in terms of other material that's available, this is the rest of the, the workshops that are in this specific area. So there's uh, Venture Design 1, which somewhat precedes this in, in the area of um, creating strong personas and problem scenarios. Um, there's a workshop that generally follows this about business models and another one about um, using uh, all these things that you've created as inputs to product development um, through the use of uh, Agile user stories. That's it. This is the uh, workshop page for, for the workshop that we just did. The venture design material is here. Startup Sprints is a structured program you can use with your teams to move through this material. And this is my contact information. So I hope you'll consider using some of these techniques and I hope you'll let me know how it goes. Thanks for joining me.